And welcome everybody to another Nothing Like a Good Book. That's where we promote up and coming authors with their writing, sometimes turning into films and TV miniseries. You never know. As uh, with Jack Shuey and what he's doing with the Bad Luck Boys. With today's journey, um, we're going to take an extensive look into the lasting impact impact of the uh, American Revolution. You know, America, it's free today because nearly 250 years ago, brave people fought a war to establish the independence of the United States and create a system of governments to protect the freedom of its citizens. Now, this book tells the story of how Americans came to fight for their freedom how they won their independence in the Revolutionary War, established a republican system of government, and became a united people with a shared history and national identity. And it is a story in which all Americans, whatever their background, even me, an Aussie, right, we can take pride because I live here and I've done for many years and proud to live in this wonderful country. And it's a great story full of courageous men and women who risk their lives to create a new nation based on the idea that government should serve people and protect their freedom. And boy, is that ever current at the moment, right, with what's going on overseas. A generation of founders expressed ideals of liberty, equality, natural and civil rights, and responsible citizenship, ideals that have shaped our history and will shape our future. And that's from the author himself, Jack D. Warren, Jr. And Jack, it's lovely to have you. Thank you for coming on the show. Well, Mark, thank you for having me. Well, uh, you know, as the turning point between colonial origins and the free nation of America, the American Revolution holds persisting importance. I mean... (laughs) Backed by the American Revolution Institute of the Society of Cincinnati, our author guest today, Jack D. Warren Jr.'s book, Freedom, The Enduring Importance of the American Revolution, is a profound look into British America, the Revolutionary War, the birth of a new nation, and what freely, uh, freedom, what it truly means, and how the events of the past hold significant importance, even in modern society. And the book trailer's on the site, uh, you'll be able to watch that as well. That's uh, go to uh, TucsonBusinessChannel.com or direct to MarkBishopMedia.com under nothing like a good book. David M. Rubenstein, he's an author of The American Story. You remember that wonderful book? This is what he's got to say. Jack Warren's account of the long-lasting importance of the American Revolution is a must-read for any student of American history. It will soon become the classic account of the revolution's importance and modern relevance. I cannot recommend this book highly enough. Boy, what do you say about that accolade, Jack? Well, um, I hope I can live up to it. I hope the readers enjoy the book. I hope they learn from it. Uh, it's certainly been a, a labor of love to write. Yeah, it's, uh, it's beautiful, and the pictures in it are gorgeous as well. Uh, you've written an excellent book, uh, an essential, desperately needed book, I would think, Fast-paced, uh, eminently readable, though. It's it's easy to read. It's handsomely illustrated, as I was just talking about. Where did you get all these pics from? Well, I've spent uh, a long career working on the American Revolution. Uh, I've been working on it since, uh, well, I'm, I'm 61 years old. I've been working on it for about 40, 42 years. And I've always been fascinated with uh, images. Of course, the American Revolution took place long before photography. Uh, and so the only images we have from that period are, are paintings, drawings, maps, and so on. And compared to the later wars, later conflicts, there aren't so many. So you, you know, you cherish uh, each one and study each one. And, and they're all they all have lessons to to share with us. So I, I wanted to share those with the readers. Mm. Uh, well, uh, the book, folks, I mean, you've got to see this. It has a vast collection of full color reproductions of paintings of the colonies people, battles, and maps, uh, beautifully illustrated, as well as a a multitude of quotes from America's founding fathers. Uh, Freedom is accurate, detailed, it's all-encompassing. In fact, uh, David Duncan, president of the American Battlefield Trust, he quotes this, not only has Jack Warren written an excellent book, he's written an essential, desperately needed book, fast-paced, readable, and so on and so on, like I said before. 
You know, Jack, uh, it tells the pivotal story, your book of the courageous men and women who risked their lives to create a new nation. Based on simple an idea, right, that the government should serve people and protect their freedom. So how would those courageous men and women feel now about their new nation? Well, the historian's job and, and is to share the past with his readers. Um, and I, I hope the readers uh, will draw their own conclusions and, and learn to apply the lessons that the book has to offer, that the past has to offer to us in their own way. Uh, actually, I think one of the challenges historians are facing these days is, is, is the sort of demand many, to which many of them rise, that they should engage in, in politics to express their own political views and so on. And, I, and that's not what I think the historian's task is. Uh, the people who fought the revolution would be amazed by the world in which we live, um, which is so different than the world that they knew. Yeah, uh, right. <laughs> I mean, just on a matter of scale, uh, there were only about, on the eve of the revolution, there were only about two and a half million people in what became the United States. Two and a half million. And, and, and to put that in perspective, that's about as many people as live in, say, metropolitan Pittsburgh or San Antonio. Hmm. That's the, that, the entire population of the United States at the time of the Declaration of Independence. And that if two and a half million sounds like a lot um, to, your reader, to, to, the, to, to readers, think about how large what we would call the sort of politically empowered number of people were. Uh, obviously, you have to immediately cut out, out all of the women. So that's half of the two and a half million. Now we're down to about 1.2 million. Mm. You have to, you have to, of the remainder remaining males, you've got to cut out oh, about 40, 50% who are all under the age of 20, who don't have any rights to participate in political life. So we're down to a little bit more than half a million, 40% of which would be slaves. So cut out another couple hundred thousand. You're down to 250,000 people maybe who could participate in public life, adult white males. Of those, you have to get a sufficient number who uh, possess property because on the, at the time of the revolution, only people who possessed a certain amount of property could vote in most places. You're down to under 200,000 people. And so, you know, so the political life of America at the time of the revolution um, involved about as many people as, say, live in, in Charleston, West Virginia or Yuma, Arizona today. Mm. Uh, I mean, a small fraction. This is a very small society compared to anything that we're acquainted with. And I try to convey that in the book, which, though it covers a vast subject and, and a long period of time, by introducing the reader to sort of intimate stories of real people, not just Jefferson and Washington, uh, Benjamin Franklin, the familiar characters, although they're all there, mm -hmm. uh, but ordinary people, people they've never heard of. Uh, who had different aims and, and, and hopes and aspirations, uh, reasons for participating in the revolution. Yeah, I, I, it's it's very detailed. There's no doubt about it. And uh, uh, as quoted before, it's quite responsible. I mean, uh, by the way, if you've just joined us, it's uh, our special guest is Jack D. Warren Jr. Uh, his book uh, is what we're talking about. It's called Freedom, The Enduring Importance of the American Revolution. I know you might roll your eyes a little, but this one's different, and it's darn good, and it really explains a heck of a lot. You know, at the beginning of the British colonies uh, of America, freedom, it really, it, it delves deep into what planted the seeds for the revolution. The Revolutionary War, you know, important figures and the ideals that the new nation was built upon. And Jack describes, you know, it tells the pivotal story of the courageous men and women who risked their lives, and they, boy, did they ever, to create a new nation based on an idea. You write in the book, Jack, that our uh, free society is based on national and personal independence, republican ideals and governance, a, a sense of shared national purpose and identity forged by the trials of the Revolutionary War. And ideals, you know, liberty, equality, natural and civil rights and responsible citizenship that have defined our history. Where's it gone wrong, my friend? Oh, I don't know that it has gone wrong. A free society is a messy society by nature. If it's going wrong in any way, it's in any effort on any side of the political spectrum to stifle reasoned debate. Um, 
people, people should be free to speak, to, to speak their mind, to express their views. And there is a rising intolerance across the political spectrum and people expressing uh, honestly held beliefs that differ with those of others. And a free society has to accept differences. I mean, Aristotle said it's the mark of an educated person to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. Um, that's the beginning of civil debate in a, in, a, in a free society. If we have one thing to remember and embrace, regardless of what our political views are today, that's what it is. One of the excerpts from the book says the most thoughtful American response came from a Pennsylvania lawyer by the name of John Dickinson in a series of essays titled Letters from a Farmer in Pennsylvania published first in Philadelphia newspapers and then reprinted in pamphlets all over the colonies. Uh, Dixon, uh, Dickinson agreed that uh, Parliament had the authority to regulate trade in the empire for the common good of all, but this authority did not extend to taxing the colonists because the power to tax, unchecked by representation in Parliament, was the power to destroy so the power to make such laws, Dickinson argued, must rest on the consent of the people, expressed through representatives of their choosing. Interesting, that. It, it, it is. And one of the things I want my readers to understand, what I want everyone to understand, is how profoundly unfree, undemocratic, unrepresentative government was everywhere in the world before the American Revolution. Britain had a reputation at the time of being the, the freest, most liberty-loving people in the world. And certainly they were compared to uh, people on the European continent uh, and elsewhere. But, but the fact of the matter is that, that British governance and society it, it, on the eve of the American Revolution, the middle of the 18th century, was not free in any way that we would define freedom. And in the, the opportunity to participate in political life in Britain was extremely circumscribed. Only a very limited number of people could vote. And frankly, voting didn't matter much because Parliament was full of rotten boroughs and and bizarre practices, you know, Birmingham and Manchester and Leeds, which were growing enormously on the eve of the revolution. Those are, you know, the 19, the great 19th century industrial cities of Britain, which had barely existed when Parliament had been organized in the medieval time. And so they didn't have any representation at all in Parliament. They were growing rapidly in population. But those people weren't represented either. They say either. The colonists weren't represented. People all over Britain weren't represented. On the other hand, you had what are called rotten boroughs, places in England where uh, – that had been perhaps populous places in the Middle Ages, but where the population had withered and – but still got to elect members of Parliament. You know, there's one, one – uh, parliamentary uh, borough uh, referred to as Old Sarum. It's outside Salisbury. Old Sarum had been a substantial place in the Middle Ages, but by the middle of the 18th century, uh, its resident population was basically sheep. Yeah. And, and it's, but it still got two representatives in Parliament uh, who were chosen essentially by the landowner who owned uh, the place where the town of Old Sarum had been. Uh, so the idea of political representation, which which is a fundamental aspect of government everywhere today, was virtually unknown, even in the country regarded as the, the freest country in the world. The United States, when it established a constitution, uh, specified that we will count every American every 10 years, a novel idea in, in 1787, mm -hmm. uh, and we will base representation on our actual numbers, uh, adjusting it every 10 years as needed. That was an absolutely novel idea uh, in the revolutionary generation. And so that, that's just one aspect of freedom is the, the right to participate in public life and to do so on basis of equality with other people who get to vote. But there are, are any number of other ways in which freedom – as we understand it, didn't exist before the revolution. Freedom of thought, freedom of religion, freedom of expression, all of those things were stifled. Yes. Not, and the revolution rejected those restrictions. Well, one of the things I try to sorry, go do on. in the book, one of the things I try to do in the book is actually to define freedom for my readers. Freedom is a, often a sort of vague term yeah. to many people, and some people will use freedom and liberty. Uh, as as the meaning the same thing, and then they actually don't. 
Liberty is, of course, a, has a Latin root, uh, libertas, and freedom is an old Anglo-Saxon term, and they, they have different meanings. Liberty is the absence of restraint, right? Nobody's going to tell you what to do if you're at liberty. And so we have a Bill of Rights which protects our liberties. And what it does is it says government shall not do these things mm. uh, and does not have the power to invade these areas of our lives to tell us what to do. So liberty is, is one central idea of freedom for us. So is equality. But now equality is a, is a and of course, is, is about one of the battleground issues of our time. What does equality mean to the revolutionary generation? It certainly meant uh, equality before the law which was a tradition that it inherited from, from uh, English practice, uh, and, but which was sacred to Americans, equality before the law. Uh, it came to embrace the idea of equality of opportunity, that people's opportunities shouldn't be stifled by law or, or by uh, encroachments on their liberties by others. Uh, today we're having a debate, a public debate, which I think could be a much more civilized debate, about the extent to which the ideal of equality uh, imposes on us uh, the demand to ensure equal outcomes for people. Is that what equality means? And I think that's what we've come to mean, or many people have come to mean when they refer to equity, mm -hmm. uh, which has taken the place of equality in our, in our public discussion. Uh, certainly that, that idea, the idea that, that somehow society guarantees to all an equal outcome, uh, is alien to the American Revolution, which was uh, based entirely on the idea of rising on your own merits, um, to having an equal opportunity uh, to do so. And the revolution was militantly about individual rights, not group rights. Uh, and we talk a lot today about group rights. Um, mm. But that, that, that idea is fairly is alien to the revolution. So you have liberty, you have equality, natural and civil rights. And it's important to understand the difference between the two. Uh, natural rights are rights inherent in the human condition. They're the same everywhere. And so when we look abroad and we see atrocities taking place, as we do this week, uh, we know those are violations of fundamental human rights. <laughs> They're the same for everyone. Civil rights are different. They will vary from country to country and circumstance to circumstance. Uh, and those are not universal. Um, they change with circumstance. But they should be consistent with our principles of equality and liberty and and natural rights as well. A key component of our concept of freedom is citizenship. That is our opportunity to participate in the body politic, in the life of the country, in public life, um, but also a responsibility to serve the republic, particularly when called upon. Military service is the most famous and most obvious example, but but to to vote, for example, and to take voting seriously and thoughtfully. Uh, those are all responsibilities of citizenship, and citizenship is one of the vital components of freedom as it, the revolution defined it. Well, Jack, it seems your passion for the American Revolution doesn't uh, end with this book. You've worked for years to uh, preserve historical locations and monuments. You've also written a variety of works on American history. A real passion. It is. Uh, in fact, this book is, 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 is reflects that. Uh, it, it looks a lot, your older readers anyway, will remember uh, the great American heritage uh, illustrated books of the 1950s, 60s, early 70s, large format books. Um, and that's what this book uh, was conceived to be, the same kind of book, a modern treatment of the American Revolution, beautifully illustrated, uh, telling the whole story. There's, to be honest, I've spent my entire adult life studying early American history, writing about early American history. I was an editor of George Washington's papers at the University of Virginia. Mm. I wrote a book about Washington's presidency. I've written other, other things about the revolutionary generation is my specialty. Um, this was a special project because this was an opportunity to pull together what I thought I had learned over decades of study, uh, the revolution as I understand it. It may seem a little odd to your listeners to say a general history of the revolution, general history of anything, uh, is a really personal undertaking because you're, what you're doing is sharing with your readers the framework that you created for yourself for understanding uh, some major event. It's a really, it's a really fun challenge, mm -hmm. no doubt. 
And, um, you know, I, I'm grateful to the publisher that indulged my over 400 pages and big format and lots of color. And because I wanted to share this story, I regard the American Revolution as our national epic. And I know that, that, that many listeners, people who love history, uh, may think of, say, the Civil War in that way. And, and I, I, I will take nothing away from the importance of the Civil War in our history. But you need to, to think, grasp what the American Revolution's transcendent importance is. It changes the direction of, of the United States forever. It defines our national ideals. Uh, the rest of our history, including our Civil War, is a consequence uh, working out of those ideals. And, and it was long and it was hard. You know, the American Revolutionary War, the war itself lasted from 1775 to peace in 1783, eight years. It's the longest war in American history, at mm -hmm. least up until these, these interminable, undeclared, you know, Asiatic wars of our yeah, time. Yeah. Uh, and it touched everybody. It touched all parts of the country. It reached from Florida to Maine, west to the Mississippi River. Uh, thousands upon thousands of people were killed and wounded, yes, shocking, homes wasn't destroyed. It? And yet the West, the West got away with it all, didn't it, really? The South on the Mason-Dixon line. I mean, this part of the world never knew what was going on, or did it? Uh, what part of the world do you mean? Oh, I'm talking about the West. Oh, well, no, it, 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 well, it doesn't, you know, the far West is not intimately involved in, in the Revolutionary War itself, but don't, you know, the, the, the implications yes, of, of the course. Revolution for the future of, of the West. I mean, without the revolution, it's a reasonable question. Historians, by the way, are supposed to not play what if, but I love what if. <laughs> right. And I want, I want the readers to play what if. No, fair what, if no, yeah. what if no revolution? Does the United States or does what colonial British America wind up uh, spanning the continent? Uh, you know, by 1850, America will be well positioned on the, you know, on the Pacific Ocean, a transcontinental republic. Mm -hmm. That doesn't happen, I don't think, without the American Revolution, because without the American Revolution, you don't have the massive flow of people in the 19th century into, uh, say, you know, if, if, if essentially the, what became the United States is like Canada, you won't get that same flow of people. Maybe our history looks a lot more like the history of Canada than it, than it does the history of the United States. And so I suspect the Far West remains a Spanish colony for a very long time achieves its independence perhaps uh, in the 19th century, but that's even questionable. I mean, keep in mind, the American Revolution is the first of the great revolutions against European empire. Yes. And, 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 and if it doesn't succeed, is, are there, it's a reasonable question, are there going to be revolutions uh, in Central and South America as there be in the generation after the American Revolution? So, you know, the American Revolution changes the course of, what will become the history of the United States, obviously, but it also has an enormous influence on the on the future history of the Western Hemisphere and the world at large. Yeah, I mean, gee, you're, you're a great talker, mate. You're a featured speaker, in fact, uh, on Washington in a series of history dialogues for members of Congress and published in uh, David Rubenstein's The American Story, Conversations with Master Historians. And you also appeared on the PBS NewsHour, C-SPAN's Washington Journal, American Presidents. That was a great show. And NPR's All Things Considered, uh, all giving you a thrill. Anything that was your favourite there, do you think? Um, I enjoy talking to a live audience. Um, <laughs> and so I, I enjoyed... Uh, maybe I shouldn't say that on a, on a show like this, I, but, uh, I love reaching people I can see. Yeah, uh, I can relate to that too, but you never know. Uh, the thing, the beautiful thing about podcasts is they can be heard in so many ways. Uh, you'd be surprised how they're heard and consequently more will hear you. And that's what's the important thing is all about. This book titled uh, freedom, the endurance importance of the American revolution and uh, Denver Brunsman, he's editor of the American Revolution Reader. He had this to say in our last accolade before we head off. But in freedom, Jack D. Warren Jr. provides an ambitious yet highly accessible narrative of the full American revolutionary era. Each page brims with illuminating details about not only how Americans agitated and fought for their freedom, but why. 
The importance of the American Revolution has become muddled as more time passes, and freedom is a refreshing, fact-based approach to educate future generations, perfect for educational settings and those seeking a better understanding of Americans' origins. Freedom. The enduring importance of the American Revolution is the best of its kind. Wow, that was another great accolade. There's no doubt about it. Uh, People really respect this brand new book. Jack, can I ask you this? What do you feel that's in this book that perhaps you haven't been able to express before? That the American Revolution astonished the people who participated in it. They, when it was over, they were amazed at how much they had managed to accomplish that they had defeated one of the world's great powers in a war of national independence and it created a new nation, imperfect in many ways, we know that, but extraordinary. Um, They knew they were living through remarkable events. Um, And what I hope to do here is to convey that sense of wonder and amazement to our readers in a somewhat cynical time that we're living in, to think about the revolution in all of its accomplishments and to appreciate that we are the heirs to a really remarkable kind of new society, new public life. Um, It was uh, the revolutionaries announced that they had created a new order of the ages. Mm -hmm. Um, It's our job to perfect that. They articulated ideals, liberty, equality, natural civil rights, citizenship that shape who we are today. Um, they knew that what they had created was imperfect and incomplete. Um, it's our job to fulfill the, their hopes, their dreams, their aspirations, make them our own. Mm. Yes, well, as you said before, despite the many factors that contributed to it, the economic success of the United States was not uh, inevitable. It was contingent on decisions Americans have made beginning with decisions made in an effort to resolve the severe economic crisis that followed the Revolutionary War. And that had a big part to play as well. There's so much in this book. I know you you scare the living daylights out of people when you say 400 pages, but you need to explain that a lot of them are pictorial and they're worth seeing and the book is is something you want to sit down with by the fire. It's one of those and it's fabulous, all right? And it's called, what's it called again? Good, you remembered. Yes, that's right. Freedom. Freedom with a capital F. The enduring importance of the American Revolution, right? The real importance of it. What's, what shaped America? What came out of it? What Everything that you do today and walk on and think about and do, somehow or other came out of what happened way back when. Way back when. And I wonder if their spirits still haunt us. Jack, it's been an absolute pleasure. Excellent talking to you. Lots of fun. Yeah, great book. I hope it does exceptionally well. Where can one purchase it? Christmas gift. What a beautiful idea. Well, Thanksgiving as well, you know. Right. Well, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's. uh, (laughs) All right. Don't Uh, don't count your chickens. (laughs) (laughs) So seriously, where can one purchase this? It's readily available online from uh, the major book dealers. Uh, Obviously, Amazon is the biggest book dealer in in the country. All I have to do is put the word freedom and my name, Jack Warren, into the search box and it'll come up. And uh, I hope it winds up on in every local bookstore as well. We need brick and mortar bookstores as much as we need online books. So, uh, but it's uh, widely available. Okay, that's good. So Amazon's a good start. Uh, do you have your own site as a matter of interest where it can be bought from as well? Uh, no, and uh, I do I not. I don't, I don't know that, but uh, uh, as I say, it, it's widely available online. So Doing we're talking very well Barnes right and now. Noble and all the traditionals, okay? All uh, the traditional outlets have it, yeah. um, and they're and they're doing very well with it, at least here in the first couple of weeks. Of, oh, that's uh, great! That's great. Good on you, mate. It's put a lot of effort into this one. It took a long time, a lot of work, burning the midnight oil, and. Uh, Uh, congratulations. I think you've got a fantastic winner here. Freedom, the enduring importance of the American Revolution, written by none other than uh, Mr. Jack Dwayne Warren Jr., correct? (laughs) That's me. That's you. Good luck, my friend. All the best and peace. peace Good luck to you and thank you for having me. You're most welcome. Goodbye now. Bye-bye now.